1939, eight days from home. Finally, Shabos arrived. It was the day. Joseph would leave his childhood behind and become a man, and he could hardly contain his excitement. The ship's bulletin board announced that the first-class social hall would be converted to a synagogue, a Jewish house of prayer, which meant Joseph might have his bar mitzvah after all. He was careful not to show his eagerness in front of his father, however. What would once have been a happy occasion in the Landau home was now fraught with anxiety, thanks to his father's paranoia. A synagogue on board the ship, Papa said. He shook his head as he paced their little room in his oversized nightclothes. The captain himself has arranged it, Mama said. Ridiculous! Did no one else see the Nazi flag fl flag overhead as we came on board? Will you not go to your own son's bar mitzvah then? Joseph's mother and Ruthie were already dressed in their nice Shabbos dresses. Joseph wore his best shirt and tie. Bar mitzvah. There won't be enough men there to form, to form a minyan, Papa said. By tradition, ten or more Jewish men a minyan was needed for a public service. No, no one who has lived in Germany for the past six years would be so foolish as to go to a Jewish service aboard a Nazi ship. Papa ran a hand over his shaved head. No, it's a trap. Meant to lure us out. That's when they'll snatch us. A trap. Mama sighed. All right, then. We'll go without you. They left him pacing the room, muttering to himself. Joseph felt like someone had yanked his heart from his chest. And all the times he dreamed of this day. His father has always been there to recite a blessing with him. But maybe this is what becoming a man is, Joseph thought. Maybe becoming a man means not relying on your father anymore. Joseph, his mother, and Ruthie stopped short just inside the first-class social hall. There weren't the required ten men for the service. There were a hundred men, probably more, all wearing yarmulkes on their head and white and black talisim, prayer shawls around their shoulders. The card tables had been pushed to the sides of the room, and stewards were adding more chairs to accommodate the crowd. A table at the front held a Torah scroll. Joseph stood and stared. It felt like ages since he'd been inside a synagogue. It had been before Crystal knocked, before the Nuremberg laws that made Jews second-class citizens, before the boycotts and book burnings, before Jews were scared to gather together in public places. Joseph's parents had always taken him to synagogue with them on Shabbos, even when other parents left their children with their nannies. It all came flooding back to him now, swaying and humming along with the prayers, craning his neck to see the Torah when it was taken out of Ark, and hoping to get a chance to touch it and then kiss his fingers as the scroll came around in a procession. Joseph felt his skin tingle. The Nazis had taken all this from them, from him, and now he and the passengers on the ship were taking it back. Gustav Schroeder, the ship's diminutive captain, was there to greet them at the door. In the gallery above the room, a number of the off-duty crew had gathered to watch. Captain, asked a rabbi, one of the men who was leading the service, I wonder if we might take down the portrait of the Fuhrer, given the circumstances. It seems inappropriate for such a sacred moment to be celebrated in the presence of Hitler. Joseph had seen paintings of the Nazi leader all over the ship, and the first-class social hall was no exception. A large portrait of Hitler hung in the middle of the room, watching over them all. Joseph's vein ra veins ran with ice. He hated that man. Hated him because of everything he'd done to the Jews, but mostly because of what Hitler had done to his father. Of course, Captain Schroeder said. He quickly called over two of the stewards, and soon they had the portrait down and were taking it from the room. In the gallery above, Joseph saw one of the crew slam a fist down on the railing and storm off. Joseph's mother gave him a kiss on the cheek, and she and Ruthie went to sit in the section reserved for the women. Joseph took a seat in the section with the men. The rabbi stood in front of the crowd and read from Hosea. Then it was time for Joseph to recite the blessing he'd been practicing for weeks. There were butterflies in his stomach as he got up in front of such a large audience and his voice broke as he stumbled through the Hebrew words. But he did it. He found his mother in the crowd. Her eyes were wet with tears. Today, Joseph said, I am a man. There were many hands to shake and many congratulations after the ceremony, but it was all a blur to Joseph. He felt like he was walking in a dream. For as long as he could remember, he'd wanted this, to no longer be a child, to be an adult. Joseph's mother and sister left to go back to visit his father in their cabin. Joseph walked the promenade deck by himself, a new man. Renata and Evelyn jumped out from behind a lifeboat and grabbed Renata by the hand. Without their parents on the ship, they had skipped synagogue to play. Joseph, come stand guard for us, Renata cried. Before he could protest, the girls dragged him to a women's restroom. He was afraid they were going to pull him inside, but instead they deposited him by the door. 
Yell if you see someone coming, Renata said breathlessly. We're going to latch all the stalls from the inside and crawl out under the door so no one can use the toilets. No, don't, Joseph tried to tell them, but they were already gone. He stood there awkwardly, not sure if he should stay or go. Soon the sisters ran back outside, hanging onto each other with laughter. A young woman staggered past them, clutching her stomach and looking green. Renata and Evelyn got quiet, and Joseph could hear the woman desperately rattling the stall doors, looking for a toilet. The woman lurched out of the bathroom, looking even more green and desperate, and wobbled away. Renata and Evelyn burst into laughter. Joseph raised himself up. This isn't funny. Go in there and unlock those doors this minute. Just because you had your bar mitzvah doesn't make you an adult, Renata told him, and Evelyn stuck her tongue out at him. Come on, Evie, let's do the bathrooms on A deck. The girls tore away and Joseph huffed. They were right. A bar mitzvah alone didn't make him an adult. Being responsible did. He walked on along the promenade, looking for a steward he could tell about the bathroom stalls. He saw two stewards who had stopped to look over the side of the sea and came up behind them. Must be doing 16 knots easy, said one of the stewards. Captain's got the engines maxed out. Has to, the other said. Them other two ships is smaller and faster. They get to Cuba first and unload their passengers, and who knows? Cuba might decide she's full up with Jews when we get there and turn us away. Joseph looked out to sea. There wasn't another ship on the horizon as far as he could see. What other ships were they talking about? More ships full of refugees? And why did it matter which one got there first? Hadn't everyone on board already applied and paid for visas? Cuba couldn't turn them away. Could they? One of the stewards shook his head. There's something they're not telling us, the shipping company. Something they're not telling Schroeder. The captain's in a tight spot, he is. Wouldn't want to be him for all the sugar in Cuba, Joseph backed away. He'd already forgotten about the stalls in the women's bathroom. If he and his family didn't make it to Cuba, if they weren't allowed in, where would they go? Isabel, the Straits of Florida, somewhere north of Cuba, 1994, one day from home. Senor Castillo was in charge of the boat. No one had voted or named him captain, but he had built the boat, after all, and he was the one at the rudder steering it, so that put him in charge. He didn't look happy about it, though. He kept frowning at the motor, and the rudder like there was something wrong. But besides a quick patch job of stuffing a sock into the bullet hole, everything was good. The lights of Havana had faded to a speck on the horizon behind them, and they had left all the other boats behind. Isabel clung to the wooden bench she sat on, squeezed in between Yvonne and her grandfather. Their boat was barely big enough for seven people, and with Luis and his girlfriend, they were practically sitting on top of each other. I think it's time we met the other person on board with us, Isabel's grandfather said. Isabel thought he meant Luis's girlfriend, but instead he pushed some of the sacks of food and jugs of water out of the way and pointed to the bottom of the boat. Staring back at them was the huge face of Fidel Castro. Luis's girlfriend gasped and then suddenly exploded with laughter. Soon all of them were laughing with her. Isabel laughed so hard her stomach hurt. Even grumpy Senor Castillo chuckled. I needed something big and thick for the bottom of the boat, he said. And seeing as there were so many signs around with El Presidente's head on them, it was true. Castro's face was everywhere in Cuba. On billboards, on taxis, and picture frames, on schoolroom walls, painted on the sides of buildings. Underneath this painting were the words, fight against the impossible and win. Well, Fidel is thick-headed, Luis said. Isabel put her hands to her mouth, but couldn't help laughing again with everyone else. You weren't allowed to say things like that in Cuba, but they weren't in Cuba anymore, were they? Do you know what the greatest achievements of the Cuban Revolution are, Isabel's father asked? Education, public health, and sports, they all said together. It was a constant refrain in Castro's lengthy speeches. And do you know what the greatest failures are, he asked? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the adults answered back, as though they'd heard that one many times before, too. Isabel smiled. That prompted someone to break out food and drinks, even though it was late. Isabel sipped from a bottle of soda. How long will it take to get to Florida, she asked. Senor Castillo shrugged. By tomorrow night, maybe. Tomorrow morning, we'll have the sun to guide us. All that matters now is we get as far away from Cuba as we can, said Luis's girlfriend. And what is your name, pretty one? Lito asked her. Amara, she said. She was very pretty, even in her blue police uniform. She had flawless olive skin, long black hair, and full red lips. No, 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 Lito said. He fanned his face. Your name must be Summer because you're making me sweat. The girl smiled, but Isabel's mother slapped Lito on the leg. Poppy, stop it. You're old enough to be her grandfather. Lito just took that as a challenge. He put his arms over his heart. I wish I was your favorite song, he told Amara, so I could be on your lips forever. If your eyes were the sea, I would drown in them. Lito was giving her piropos, the flirtatious compliments Cuban men said to women on the street. Not everyone did it anymore, but to Lito, it was like an art form. Amara laughed and Luis smiled. 
Maybe we shouldn't talk about drowning, Poppy said, clutching to the side of the boat as they chopped into a wave. What do you think the states will be like? Isabel's mother asked everyone. Isabel had to stop and think about that. What would the United States be like? She hadn't much time to even imagine it. Shelves full of food at the store, Senor Castillo said. Being able to travel anywhere we want, anytime we want, said Amara. I want to be able to choose who I vote for, Luis said. I want to play baseball for the New York Yankees, Yvonne said. I want you to go to college first, his mother told him. I want to watch American television, Yvonne said. The Simpsons. I'm going to open my own law office, Senora Castillo said. Isabel listened as everyone listed more and more things they were looking forward to in the States. Clothes, food, sports, movies, travel, school, opportunity. It all sounded so wonderful, but when it came down to it, all Isabel really wanted was a place where she and her family could be together and happy. What do you think El Norte will be like, Poppy? Isabel asked. Her father looked surprised at this question. No more ministry of telling people what to think or else, he said. No more getting thrown in jail for disagreeing with the government. But what do you want to do when you get there, Senor Castillo asked. He hesitated while everyone stared at him, his eyes searching, Castro's face on the bottom of the boat as though there were answers hidden there. Be free, Poppy said finally. Let's have a song, Lito said. Chabela, play us a song on your trumpet. Isabel's chest tightened. She told her parents what she'd done, but not Lito. She knew he would never have let her do it. I traded my trumpet, she confessed. For the gasoline, her father, her grandfather was shocked, but that trumpet was everything to you. No, not everything, Isabel thought. It wasn't my mother and father and you, Lito. I'll get another one in the state, she said. Lito shook his head. Here, let's have a song anyway. He began singing a salsa song and tapping out the rhythm on the side of the metal boat. Soon, the whole boat was singing, and Lito stood out and held a hand to Amara, inviting her to dance. Poppy, sit down. You'll fall out of the boat, Isabel's mother told him. I can't fall out of the boat because I've already fallen for this princess of the sea, he said. Amara laughed and took his hand, and the two of them danced as best they could in the swaying boat. Mommy started counting clave by clapping, and Isabel frowned, trying to follow the beat. Still can't hear it, Chabela? Lito asked. Isabel closed her eyes and focused. She could almost hear it. Almost. And then the motor spluttered and died, and the music stopped. Mahmoud, Kilas, Turkey, 2015, two days from home. Mahmoud could hear music beyond the fence. It was hard to see for all the people. He stood in a long line with his family, waiting at the border to gain admission into Turkey, near the city of Kilis. Around them were countless more Syrian families, all hoping to be let in. They carried everything they owned with them, sometimes in suitcases and duffel bags, but more often stuffed into pillowcases and trash bags. The men wore jeans and t-shirts and track suits. The women wore dresses and abayas and hijabs. Their children looked like miniature versions of them and acted like miniature adults too. There were very little crying and whining and none of the kids were playing. They had all walked too far and seen too much. After leaving the car behind, Mahmoud and his family had followed the map on their phone. Skirting cities held by Daesh and the Syrian army and the rebels and the Kurds as best they could. Google Maps told them it would be an eight-hour walk, and they split the journey up by sleeping in a field. It was hot out by day, but it got cold at night, and Mahmoud and his family had left all their extra clothes in the car in their haste to escape. The next morning, they had seen the people, dozens of them, hundreds, refugees, just like Mahmoud and his family, who had left their homes in Syria and were walking north to Turkey, to safety. Mahmoud and his family had fallen into step with them and disappeared among their ranks. Invisible, just as Mahmoud liked it. Together, the shambling throng of refugees was ignored by the American drones and the rebel rocket launchers and the Syrian army tanks and the Russian jets. Mahmoud heard explosions and saw smoke clouds, but no one cared about a few hundred Syrian people leaving the battlefield. And now they were in line with him, all those hundreds of people and thousands more, and they weren't invisible anymore. Turkish guards in light green camo gear with automatic weapons and white surgical masks over their faces walked up and down the line, staring at each of them in turn. Mahmoud felt like he was in trouble. He wanted to look away, but he was worried that might make the guards think he was hiding something. But if he looked right at them, they would notice him, maybe pull him and his family out of line. Mahmoud stared straight ahead at his father's back instead. His father's shirt was strained, stained at the armpits, and with the quick sniff of his own shirt, Mahmoud realized he stank too. They had walked for hours, in the hot sun, without a bath, without a change of clothes. They looked tired and poor and wretched. If he were a Turkish border guard, he wouldn't have let in any of these dirty, squalid people, himself included. 
Mahmoud's father kept their papers tucked into his pants under his shirt, along with all of their money. The only other thing they own now besides two phones and two chargers. When Mahmoud and his fi family finally got to the front of the line late in the day, Mahmoud's father presented their official documents to the border agent. After what seemed like an eternity of looking over their papers, the border guard finally stapled temporary visas onto their passports and let them through. They were in Turkey. Mahmoud couldn't believe it. Step after step, kilometer after kilometer, he'd begun to think they would never, ever escape Syria. But as relieved as he was, he knew they still had so far, so very far to go. Ahead of them stretched a small city of white canvas tents. Their pointed tops staggered like white caps on a choppy sea. There were no trees, no shade, no parks or football fields or rivers, just a sea of tents and a forest of electric poles and wires. Hey, we're in luck, Mahmoud's dad joked. The circus is in town. Mahmoud looked around. There was a main street in the camp, a wide lane where refugees had set up little shops selling phone cards and camp stoves and clothes and things people had brought with them but no longer wanted or needed. It was like a giant rummage sale, and it seemed like everybody in the camp was there. The path was crammed full of Syrians, all strolling along like they had nothing else to do and nowhere else to go. All right, Mahmoud's father was saying, a man in the group we walked with gave me the name of a smuggler who can get us from Turkey to Greece. A smuggler, mom said. Mahmoud didn't like the sound of that. Either to him, smuggler meant illegal and illegal meant dangerous. Dad waved their fears away. It's fine. This is what they do. They get people into the EU. The EU, Mahmoud knew, was the European Union. He also knew... They were much more strict about letting people in than Turkey was. Once you were in one of the EU countries like Greece or Hungary or Germany, you could apply for asylum and be granted official refugee status. It was getting there that was the hard part. I've been talking to him on WhatsApp. Dad continued holding up his phone. It will be expensive, but we can pay. And we'll have to get to Izmir on the Turkish coast. Assuming we stop to sleep every night. That's a 19-day walk. Or it's a 12-hour car ride non I can find us a bus. Mahmoud and his mother and sister and brother walked the shopping street. People called out to one another in Arabic, and music from radios and TVs filled the air. Other children darted in and out among the adults, laughing and chasing each other in the alleys of tents off the main drag. Mahmoud caught himself smiling. After Aleppo, the near-constant gunfire and explosions, punctuated by the oppressive quiet of an entire city trying their hardest not to draw attention to themselves, this place felt alive, even if it was dusty and cramped. Mahmoud saw a cardboard box of used toys at one of the shops and knelt to dig in it while his mother and brother and sister walked on. He sifted through it, hoping, yes, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. It was the one with the red bandana. The box didn't have any other Ninja Turtles in it, but Waleed would get excited to get it. Mahmoud hoped so, at least. Waleed didn't seem to get excited about much these days. Mahmoud paid 10 Syrian pounds for it, about 5 cents in American money. A car honked behind Mahmoud, and he turned like everybody else. It was an old blue Opal taxi traveling so slowly Mahmoud could walk faster. It was the only car Mahmoud had seen in the camp, and the crowd parted for it as it drew closer. A Syrian pop song blared from the radio, and young men and women danced and laughed alongside the taxi. As it passed, Mahmoud saw a young couple sitting in the back. The woman was dressed in a white satin dress and veil. It was a marriage procession, Mahmoud realized. Back in Syria, it was a tradition to be escorted to your wedding by a parade of cars to help carry you into your new life. Mahmoud remembered his uncle's wedding before the war. His uncle had worn a tuxedo and his bride had worn a dress of sparkling jewels and a tiara, and they had been escorted by a dozen cars to a party where Mahmoud had eaten a piece of the delicious seven-tiered cake and danced with his mother to a real band. Here, the couple's only escort was a group of rowdy teenage boys running behind the taxi, and their destination was a dirty white tent with whatever food they'd been able to buy in the camp's market, but everyone seemed to be having fun. The old taxi's exhaust pipe made a sound like a gunshot, pock, and everybody ducked instinctively. The spell of happiness and safety was momentarily broken by the unforgettable memories of the chaos they had just escaped. Mahmoud's heart was still racing when someone put a hand on his shoulder and he jumped. It was his dad. Mahmoud, where's your mother? Where are Walid and Hana? His father asked. I found us a ride, but we have to leave now. 